Welcome to a carbon neutral future. I'm Emily Kirsch. I'm the founder and CEO of a Silicon Valley based innovation firm called Powerhouse. Powerhouse connects startups, corporations, and investors to build an energy and mobility system that is decarbonized. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Powerhouse Ventures, which backs digital technology startups that are changing the way we power our lives. I'm thrilled to be moderating this conversation this morning with these global leaders, uh, especially because two of them are two of our closest corporate partners, that's Schneider Electric and Enel. I would like to begin by introducing our guests. I've asked them to share something about themselves that has made them who they are that is not part of their bio or their resume. So starting with you, Francesco Storace, CEO and general manager of NL based in Italy. What is something about you that has made you who you are? Um, she asked me to think about it a few minutes ago, actually two <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> One minute ago. <laughs> so uh, I should tell you, two things. I sleep a lot. I sleep very well and I dream a lot. I mean, many decisions of my life were taken after I had certain dreams. It's true, okay? And second, and, and they were good decisions, I must say, in retrospective. And second, I have always had this thing that if I see you, I see you as children. When you were children, three, five years old, so that has helped me to deal with people that not necessarily were friendly. When I saw them as children, it helped me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jean-Pascal Tricoir. So Schneider chairman. being very, very global, I don't sleep a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably the, co but I dream. I, and we dream together from time to time. I don't know. Recurrent. That I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But, <laughs> Uh, you asked me something that kind of uh, shaped my view of the world. I spent half of my uh, uh, career uh, in emerging countries where energy is uh, an essential, essential part of your life. And the impact of energy is huge. So probably it has driven uh, the whole mission of the company to efficiency mm. and sustainability. Mm. Because when you live in those countries, you understand the true value of energy and green energy particularly. And I didn't say this, but as probably all of you in the room know, Jean-Pascal Tricoir is CEO of Schneider Electric, based in France, also part of the International Business Council, along with Francesco Starace. On to you, Dr. Amani Abu Zaid. Uh, Amani is the Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy for the African Union Commission, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. <coughs> Tell us about yourself. Uh, um what made me what I am? That's the question. Please. Uh, uh, my mom. <laughs> uh, true, because uh, a, a, a daring uh, a person, and she believed that there's no such thing as impossible. Mm -hmm. And she instilled that in us. And I do believe that I can do any and everything whenever I want. And I'm determined. Fantastic. So, <laughs> no, really. And she believed also in something that's very important, that there's no such thing as a scientist or a, um, uh, an economist. You, we are all all-rounded people. So you have to excel in music. You have to excel in sports. You have to excel in, uh, in, uh, in education and in your social life. So we are a whole, and we have to also nourish all aspects of ourselves. And that's what keeps me driving uh, and going on. Um, uh, family, uh, friends, and the belief that nothing is impossible. Thank you. Benoit Potier, Chairman and CEO of Air Liquide, based in France. What is something that has made you who you are that's not part of your resume? Well, first of all, if Francesco had two minutes, I had one. <laughs> so, plus the time that it took for all of us to... Well, um, one thing in particular, I started my career as an actor <laughs> for one year, <laughs> which is a little bit special. And then I decided that I would be better off being an engineer, mm -hmm. and so I choose to join Air Liquide, and I'm still there. So, and the second point I would say is I have four girls at home, three girls and a wife, I should say a wife and three girls, <laughs> uh, but I think it is shaping more or less the view that you may have about diversity. Mm. Mm. Excellent. Just a simple word, but that's interesting. That's great. 
Well, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be leading this conversation this morning. To set the context, I'd like to ask everyone in the room to think what percent of primary energy is wasted across generation, transportation, heavy industry, and buildings? What percent? Does anyone know? What percent's wasted? 60, I heard. Close. Higher. 65, do I hear 66? 67%, <laughs> 67% of primary energy is wasted across those four areas. And you either knew that because you're an expert in the space or because you just read the program description, but either way, that's, that's, that's not acceptable. So in order for us to reach our global carbon goals and climate goals, we have to increase efficiency dramatically in those four areas. There are breakthrough technologies and business models that are changing efficiency as we know it. It's enabling us to turn waste into wealth. And so the conversation today is about systemic efficiency and how we can use it to mitigate that waste and drive us towards the global carbon goals that we all share. So um, Jean-Pascal, I'd love to start with you. If you, uh, you along with Francesco, are co-chairs of the World Economic Forum's new initiative, on energy optimization for a carbon neutral future. Can you start by setting the context, what is systemic efficiency and how does it relate to a carbon neutral future? Well, it starts with the observation you just made, which is our system is today 67% inefficient. So if you want to tackle the big deadlock, which is energy fall on climate, you have to tackle efficiency. And you have to be systemic because it's not only on the consumption, it is also on the production. So all of it has to come together. So first observation, we are on a very bad trajectory, probably three to four degrees of climate increase. We should be at 1.5, therefore we need to change. But there are, according to us, two good news. Well, the first news is that there is a big awareness now on the sort of tipping point. The world wants to has understood that the biggest challenge of this generation is climate change. So it's, and it's very visible in Davos. The second uh, point, which is really good news, is that while we didn't have the technologies to reconcile those two contradictions, energy for and climate, there are two big breakthroughs which make it now possible to reconcile. Uh, make no mistake, we, don't see, we see a future where there will be still a use of all sorts of energy, including fossil energies. But one, digital, digital applied to the Internet of Things, connected to big data, connected to artificial intelligence, allows you with a much lower cost to get to a much higher level of efficiency in buildings, particularly, I'm sure we're going to speak about them, in industry and everywhere. So that's a new level. The second thing is a change of the generation of electricity. Electricity, everybody speaks about it, it's only 20% of our energy consumption today. And it should be, if we want to decarbonize, because it's the only way to decarbonize, at least 40% of what we do in the next coming 20 years, which is considerable. That means double the investment respect to what we've done since the beginning of the history of electricity in the next coming 20 years. And at the same time, as we use more electricity, the best example are electric cars, probably, as a, as a transition, we have to decarbonize it. So going from the very small 6% renewable where we are today to at least 40% in the next coming 20 years. So this is a full transformation, but when you put everything together and work with a lot of companies, then you go from a trajectory of 4 degrees, which is absolutely unacceptable, to a 1.5 degree, which means that the climate of the, of the Earth is turning into more reasonable boundaries. And if we do even better, because I'm sure we're going to discover more technologies in the next coming 20 years, we could also be better than the 1.5 and come back to uh, carbon neutral or carbon negative uh, territories. Excellent. Thank you for the context. According to the International Energy Agency, global primary energy efficiency improvements only grew by 1.2% in 2018. That was the slowest rate of growth over the entire past decade. So, Amani, over to you as a member of the IEA's Global High-Level Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency. Can you tell us how you see this from, from the Africa perspective? Thank you very much for this uh, question. And the way we see it from Africa, I'm, uh, I must first tell you about what is going on in Africa or the African reality. We have more than uh, half of African uh, population 
that's 600 million people who do not have access to energy. We have 900 million people, that's three quarters of a continent, who do not have access to clean cooking, meaning they're still cutting the woods and, uh, 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 in order to adjust you know, the domestic uses of, uh, of energy. This is not acceptable. So uh, when we talk about not acceptable economically, but it's not acceptable as a human right, neither. Uh, 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 when we talk about efficiency from, for, for Africa, it's true that uh, this helps with the, uh, with the uh, reaching, you know, the global uh, uh, targets on carbon. But essentially for us, uh, when we talk about uh, efficiency, it's because it optimizes uh, the use of our scarce resources, whether they are uh, financial and or energy available to free it up for more people to come into uh, 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 to, to access energy, whether uh, electricity or uh, uh, energy, domestic uses of energy and so on and so forth. So our perspective is a, a, a little bit different from, uh, from uh, the northern uh, part of the world. That said, it has been uh, proven, studied, uh, researched, and proven that if all Africans have access to energy, still our impact on the carbon emission is neutral, uh, which means that we are, uh, uh, we are determined also to use all uh, uh, available uh, <coughs> technologies and uh, resources for us to allow our people to grow and, uh, uh, and to develop. Uh, it's a con this happens at the continent that's very rich when it comes to resources, renewable and non-renewable. And uh, just to let you know that we are uh, deploying a massively renewable energy on the continent, solar, uh, wind, uh, geothermal, off-grid, uh, uh, hydro. Some of our countries are 90% uh, reliable on, on renewable uh, resources. So the, the question about carbon emission does not come really to play uh, in Africa because <coughs> we are eager to access knowing that, again, as I said, our impact on the carbon emission is, uh, is neutral uh, and uh, unfortunately we are bearing the highest cost uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, form of uh, disasters that hit our continent uh, now more repetitively and more severely than they ever did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the urgency is very, very clear. Um, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Gutierrez, who's going to be speaking here later today, recently said that the fight for climate solutions will be fought and either won or lost in cities. So Francesco, over to you. Enel operates the power grid in some of the world's largest megacities. You operate across 33 countries, leading both innovation and decarbonization. What role do cities play in a low carbon future? How is Enel using innovation and decarbonization to achieve those goals? Thank you. I think, by the way, I. Jean Pascal and I will lead this uh, big effort on systemic efficiency, which focuses on cities. People crowd in cities more and more. We know that world population moves into cities, whether we like it or not. I mean, people seem to love going in cities, and we're not here to discuss why that happens. It happens. So we see cities as implicit, implicit public-private partnerships. You don't sign a contract when you go in a city, but you subscribe to the way city work implicitly. And if you don't, the city pushes you up. So they work like organic beings. They develop their own way of doing things. They are, we consider cities also, mines, huge deposits of circular economy value added potential. The waste and the way in which we manage cities leaves a lot of space to recycle and create wealth out of that. They are also natural breeding grounds for everything that has to do with digital. Data and AI find their best and immediate application on cities, where densely uh, packed human beings and things are stuffed together. So, there's so much you can do to make a system like a city more efficient when you look at it this way. So we are going to look for any input because this is a study we're going to launch with uh, WEF uh, in this month. 
to make this meaningful approach to cities and help mayors and planners of cities to look at cities this way. Um, we, we have a reflection all together. We think cities can become a meta-state. The way in which people tend to live in cities tends to converge to a model that is the city model. So there is a lot more similarity, if you want, between Bogota and Sao Paulo rather than Colombia and Brazil. It's facts. I mean, people living in cities, they tend to have their style, but it's a more similar style because they live in this environment. So it's a huge potential for efficiency. It's a huge potential for change and decarbonizing. What we do in, in NL, of course, we focus on, on the network system that drive and, and make cities inhabitant, uh, inhabitants uh, happy. There's so much you can do on converging infrastructure. I'm not going to bother you and to bore you with all of that uh, that we're doing, starting from the <coughs> basics. Digitize whatever you have in cities is the first step to everything else. Without this, it's useless. So the digital world is the first milestone of this trip. Perfect. Thank you. Benoit, over to you. From your perspective as an energy supplier, what are the opportunities, especially in the hard to abate sectors, as well as cities um, and heavy industry? And specifically, would love to hear about your work um, with a startup that is doing clean concrete, which is actually a thing unlike clean coal. So those are many questions in one. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to they all are. <laughs> be as efficient as I can. Uh, first of all, when, when we talk about heavy industries, in our mind, it's steel, chemical, refining, glass making, cement, power, I mean, all those heavy. And all are concerned about energy efficiency, for, uh, opportunities. First source of energy is efficiency. Absolutely, no doubt. I think it applies in building, in many places, but also in the heavy industries. So that, that's the first thing we can do and have in our company decided to, uh, to do. The second thing is when you think about emissions, it's most of the time related to the fact that you burn carbon to produce heat. It's <coughs> present all across industries. So heat and generation of heat by burning less carbon or burning hydrogen is, is something which is at the heart of many issues. So that's why electrification is fine, but it has to be a systemic approach because electricity is a system by definition. It's not just one thing. You cannot just have a nuclear plant to provide your home. I mean, this is or any sort of plant. It's a systemic approach. That's why we like hydrogen, because hydrogen is a component of the systemic approach. Uh, the third thing is, Jean-Pascal said it, digital will play a very significant role in the way we optimize our processes inside the plant, but also the flows, the entrance. I mean, how we buy energy, how we process our products, also how we sell to our customers, and, and, and the whole system. It's, it's no more in the future world. It's no more, I have my plant, and I optimize everything around my plant. It's actually a system. And it's, it's true in any cluster. So that's the third point. And because energy, the nature of energy is changing, I think decentralization of the production and the usage of energy is very important which links to how do we optimize grids in the future. If you have renewable energy on your roof, and if you want to store this energy, you may be short, and so you have to buy from the grid, but also you may want to sell the access to the grid. So the microgrids and the blockchains to organize the contracts between you know, the different are very important. So the, the whole nature of the electrical system is going to change. So decentralization is going to be important. And finally, uh, because you asked the question, I mean, how do you, do you do that alone or do you work with startups or how do you get the innovation that is available in the world? Well, this is a good example. Solidia is a startup that was based on the fact that you can actually 
reduce the emission of CO2 for cement production, which is accounting for 8 to 9% of the global emissions. <coughs> Huge emitter of CO2. By absorbing the CO2, so feeding the process with CO2, and capturing the CO2 in the process of manufacturing cement. And as a result, the CO2 emissions would be reduced by 70%. Big number. So we took a stake in that company because we were working with them, supplying CO2, and I mean, helping them to manage the CO2 and the usage of CO2. And so we took a stake. Our capital venture group take a participation in the company. And now we are helping them to expand. We have two or three major projects in uh, the world. And if everything works well at the scaling up level, then this technology will be available for cement. By the way, the quality of the cement is even better than the quality of the normal cement. So it means that there's still a lot of potential for usage of CO2 in industries as a feedstock to actually absorb the CO2 emitted by those who have to emit. Perfect. <clears throat> Jean-Pascal, in order to truly optimize energy and enable a low carbon future, especially in cities, what solutions are needed across sectors uh, and, and how does that enable us to speed up the transition? What is Schneider Electric most interested in as it relates to innovation in cities? Yeah, look, I, I, I think we should realize that there is, uh, f first, really the world is realizing that efficiency, we said it several times, is the cheapest, the fastest, the greenest way to produce energy. Uh, we were uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday in a meeting on one very large oil company said, well, let's speak first always about efficiency, while frankly the debate in 90, is 90% about the supply uh, today. On the second point, which is really important, I'm citing another oil and gas company, said let's stop speaking <coughs> about new technologies. All the technologies we need are already existing. They are just not deployed. So it's time for us to really integrate that. There is no excuse. We can really do everything three times more efficiently everywhere we are. Now, Francesco was mentioning we all live in cities. We spend 90% of our life in buildings. What is the biggest problem of cities? It is very complex and it is highly fragmented. So there are places where we meet, that's called the solidarity behind the electrical grid, the water network, the transportation network, but all the rest is infinitely fragmented. Your car, your house, your building, and um, the problem, if you remember, you rewind in time, uh, the concept of smart city was booming 10 years ago. And it was always, let's have a very holistic approach to the city. And it didn't work because the reality is that we don't build many greenfield cities in the world. And when you want to make a city completely or more efficient, you need all the stakeholders to operate or to go into that direction while all of them are owners of different parts of the city. So on, we are working on that systemic efficiency because we think we have two things to do on, at the same time. The first point is really on the common points, the, corner, the common ownership of the cities that can be the grid, the water and things. There they should be conductors and typically utilities or network operators are great conductor of what is between the elements of the city in the field of electricity. But then the way to make this complex system more simple is to make sure that each part, each nucleus of that very complex system is by itself trying to be net zero positive, right? So take a building. We see a future where buildings will be more electric, more digital, and more autonomous because that electricity we are talking about is not the one that... Uh, that Benoit was, was mentioning before, is going to be fully autonomous on the roof, through the glass. They will be producing and storing energy locally. They will be using the batteries of the car in, uh, in the parking lot to store even more energy. And that means that building will be by itself quite autonomous and putting no pressure on the rest of the organism. Is that a vision of the future? Well, I'll speak about what we did with the Edge, which is a, an iconic building we did in Amsterdam with OVG, it's already existing. And you can't say that Holland is the sunniest place on earth. So it <laughs> works. Uh, and we do the same thing, speak about industry. Uh, we do today industry, which are again much more electrical with hydrogen, uh, much more 
completely digitized and with a microgrid at the door, and you would say, yeah, but you can't power big factories with that. Well, we do with a very large chemical company, a new, one of their biggest factories is going to be fully green mm -hmm. and locally green. Green once, mean, once you what have does that, it mean? What does green mean in that case? Because I think to Benoit's point. Green, wind, solar, mm -hmm. and storage. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. Um, and that is becoming feasible. That plant doesn't have any pressure on the rest of the environment anymore, so it's much easier to manage from that point of view. So it's a combination. On a, yesterday, we had, uh, during, during our first session, um, one of us was speaking about the net positive uh, heating system in the Nordics, in Scandinavia. Then again, not the sunniest place on Earth, uh, especially in winter. But this is being done as we speak. So I think we should get inspiration of all those verticals, uh, making the water network, uh, desalination network, uh, plants, uh, eating systems, transportation systems, and getting inspiration of everything which is getting carbon neutral, carbon negative at times. That was the case of that uh, eat, eat, uh, eat network. Buildings. Which are becoming, which are having no impact on, uh, and make sure that everything we do anew is going into that direction. Uh, Fatih Birol uh, from the IEA yesterday was mentioning that we need to double or triple the rate of retrofit. That seems big, but when you retrofit on digital, the cost of building, for instance, the cost of retrofit is much lower. So if we do those two things, building a new efficient and retrofitting faster than we do today, we are on a trajectory to be back to the 1.5 degrees. I'm sorry to be a little bit detailed on that one, but if we want it to happen, we have to simplify the problem. Otherwise, we're going to be waiting mm. for each other, and we're going to never start. Mm. I wanted to jump in uh, uh, because, I mean, earlier I gave you, uh, uh, well, I drew the, the landscape of Africa when it comes to access, but I have now a contrasting, almost a contrasting story also about Africa. Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent and is now the, almost the hope of the world when it comes to digitalization. And we are approaching this digitalization and adopting it in a very aggressive manner, building on the fact that uh, very often we don't have a legacy. So we can afford to jump in into uh, the latest and the newest. And uh, uh, talking about, about uh, uh, urbanization and talking about cities, and that's really the fantastic opportunity that we're having on the continent. We can afford then for the very first time that our cities are uh, being built as smart. Our grids are, are now what we are promoting is smart grids. The off-grid and the mini-grid solutions that you just mentioned in the continent, they are not of the future. They are being applied already because this is how now we are lighting up our villages and our decentralized uh, towns. So I think we are also on the verge of a breakthrough, and the, the, there is no wonder they're calling this the, the uh, Africa decade, is that with the use of thanks to the technology that is now being available and uh, our young people who, who are our greatest asset and the fact that we are growing so fast we can afford to adopt all these new concepts and uh, which are beneficial not only for us because it, they work for us and they allow us uh, uh, the access and uh, the benefits that we uh, that we want but also going in the direction you know where the world wants wants to hit uh, to to head uh, the question of retrofitting on the continent, uh, obviously it depends where you are, but it's not, it's not really the one that we are very much concerned with, knowing that, as I said, many of our projects are anew. So what is the game changer? The game changer is that competitive prices. Uh, and it helps that, again, even all these, the new technologies, I mean, uh, the new solutions are becoming uh, 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 increasingly, that they are becoming, you know, uh, 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 increasingly more affordable, which, which plays well for us in, uh, in the continent. Excellent. I think everyone has mentioned digital solutions, and so far the conversation has been pretty high level. So to give some on-the-ground examples from Silicon Valley, um, you all we've been talking a lot about buildings. There is a startup called Station A that spun out of NRG, who you all are familiar with. They are using geospatial data yeah. to 
analyze every single commercial building in the United States, which they've already done to assess their solar and storage potential. So it's all based on ML and AI, which can enable the kind of solutions that everyone has discussed. Another example um, is a startup called Leap that has uh, enabled the aggregation of distributed energy resources to be bid into demand response markets um, all through a single API so that they can integrate car batteries and home HVAC systems and commercial buildings and use that to actually balance the grid and re reduce peak demand. So I think you all are the global leaders of these massive companies and there's this innovation coming from the ground that is meeting you halfway. You have the, the scale and the resources and the customer base. They have the new types of technology, the digital technology, and, and, and it's great to meet I mean, in the What you are referring to is startups are contributing a lot, but those are technologies which are on the shelves today. I mean, from many origins and already at scale in many places. Mm -hmm. They are just, uh, take the, the industry of the building, the time for the building industry to integrate that in architecture exactly. is too long. Mm. I mean, we've got to rethink the way we design buildings on some part of our factories. That's, uh, but the technologies are already existing. Don't, it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. The most important is to deploy them at scale today. That's mm -hmm. why we call this initiative systemic efficiency. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about making your room more energy efficiency, more energy efficient, but it's about combining different things which exist today but cannot be worked on individual basis. They need to be harmonized and put together. And, and that is, that's the most difficult thing. So you take the example yeah. of the building. You can't make your, if, if you want to uh, have your building autonomous, you probably digitally have to make sure that it consumes more when <laughs> the energy is produced from renewable. So you need it to be digital if you want it to be renewable and autonomous. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> systemic at the level of the city and systemic at the level of the building, right? Exactly. Benoit, what's the role of government in all of this? What can governments do to enable this transition to accelerate? Well, interestingly, um, three years ago, we created in Davos the Hydrogen Council with 13 companies that are today 81, mm. sort of alliance on hydrogen. And as a result, we've been talking to governments, I mean, for about three years. Um, maybe one of the most important thing that is missing today is the carbon pricing pre predictability. Mm -hmm. I'm insisting on predictability. Uh, I'm not a f in favor of a tax, but if we had to put a tax, maybe that would give some sort of predictability. What is missing? Mm -hmm is the ability for industries to actually plan their investment and say, if I invest 100, I will get this type of return because I, I, I know, because there's, for instance, a, a, a floor and a cap on CO2, I know that my investment will have a return between X and Y. So that is something that is really missing. We have a lot of discussions with government. It's not simple because one size cannot fit all. Mm -hmm. By industry, by sector, you may have a $5, a $10, a $50 of $100, and it depends. And I think one price might kill a lot of industries. So it's not a simple issue, but that's one. That, that's a very important one. The second point is, whatever you do in this field of uh, you know, changing the systemic approach to energy is financing. I think governments may play a role, not necessarily in giving subsidies alone, but organizing and helping the financing of this new uh, energy system in the world. We are talking about 70 billion in the case of hydrogen, but over 10 years. And if you compare that with the budgets that are spent by governments today, it's not a lot. So financing is a second thing. Uh, regulation, of course. I mean, when we started hydrogen in European countries, there was no regulation for liquid hydrogen storage. So in the absence of any regulation, it was decided to put the CIVISO regulation. Now, for those who are familiar with what CIVISO regulation is all about, it's nuclear. I mean, it's just a nightmare. So there's a mismatch between reality and regulation. The third point, and I think education, because there's so much debate about you know, energy and, and uh, people don't know what they are mm -hmm. talking about. They think this type of energy is good mm -hmm. because they, they have you know, heard on TV or they have seen that on the net and they don't have a clue about what is good, what is not good. And I think education 
of citizens is something that should be also organized with uh, <coughs> government. One point I'd like to add to the city, I mean, discussion, because I didn't uh, say that before. I think the circular economy mm -hmm. is much more related to cities than to governments. And the future is going to be a lot of cities that will organize the ecosystems and we have a very interesting experience with the city of Oslo, where there's a, a so-called magic factory. It's the name of this initiative, where you have regrouped the manure from agriculture, the production of biogas, the conversion, the separation of CO2 and fuel, the liquefaction of fuel and distribution of bio, liquid biogas, and then the usage of CO2 for greenhouses and experience to grow tomatoes uh, with the best universities in, in Norway. So a full, and the waste coming from the city being treated. So it's a very interesting experience where we as Ehrlichid are involved, but that show the way for the future. The cities will organize themselves around, I mean, the, the circular economy and I think whatever we said about buildings in the cities must be also supplemented by the fact that part of the energy will be produced from the ecosystems mm -hmm. around the cool. city. <coughs> the <coughs> last two questions that I'll ask of each of you, I mean, if each of you could take 60 seconds or less to share what is the one key takeaway that you would like everyone in the room to walk away with? Benoit, starting with you. Number one, it is now. Time is good. I think that, that it is happening. And the second one is hydrogen as a bright future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Imani? Uh, I have two. Uh, one is that developing world is an opportunity, despite the challenges, is a great opportunity for <coughs> the developing world, but for the world as well. And two, a recommendation. The recommendation is put women in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult to beat that one, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I would say, well, we spent the past 20 years to leverage digital to change the way we live together as human beings. Let's make sure we use the next 20 years to leverage digital to make sure that we change the way we live with our environment and let's make it much more efficient. I think the theme of Davos this year is very clear. It's about the energy transition towards clean energy. And this is going to take the world uh, fast, faster, much faster than what you all think. It's happening really, really fast. I have to say, carbon might have a future, hydrogen might have a future, if they fix the atrocious carbon footprint of hydrogen, which today is one of the most polluting sources in terms of CO2. So it can be a future uh, storage media for energy provided it cleans itself from the incredible footprint of carbon that is associated with hydrogen today. I'll turn it back to you then in the last question. Also, I just noticed those great socks. Oh, yeah. I, have <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at them from here. Sweet, sweet uh, and uh, Enel. <laughs> <on the first. laughs> last, last question. I, sorry, I didn't look. <laughs> no, no, great. Wonderful. Taking it, taking it back um, to the high level so, so that we're ending um, um, ending, ending with this, with this, with this personal question and, and this high-level question is, if each of you could change one thing about the world, based on everything you've done, everything we can do, what would it be? Starting with you, Francesco. I think I would like to um, accelerate uh, what is going on right now in terms of reducing and eliminating carbon from the energy systems. I think that's really going to be beneficial for society, beneficial for the planet, helping everyone has having a little bit of a view beyond this gloom of uh, melting uh, glaciers and disasters looming. That's something that is possible and I would like this to happen faster. Agreed. Jean-Pascal. Be just faster. Just have no excuse to procrastinate and do like we used to do. Mm. There is no reason there is a big problem our kids are holding us accountable for the future and we bear a huge responsibility. There is no excuse to wait and people in the future will look at our generation and say they knew, they were the first one to know, 
they were the first one to be able to solve why on earth did they keep going the same way as before for the next 10 or 20 years. So it's now on fast. Well said. Uh, I, I did say, and when I said put women in charge, actually, I, not as a joke, I mean, I, I really meant it. I mean, we, we are, um, uh, I, I think that women are more audacious and aggressive when it, uh, to t and more conscientious when it comes to uh, addressing the, the problems uh, heads on, especially that we bear many of the consequences. And unfortunately, we are only considered, if considered, only at the very far end as users. No, I want women to be, at, uh, to be involved and to be part of the solution all across the value chain, from com concept, from policy, from imp implementation, operation, and from the user side. And that's why we established the network, African Network for Women in Infrastructure to promote exactly that. And I believe women are the solution, not only to the energy efficiency issue, but to many of the world's uh, issues as well. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Benoit. Well, uh, what I would say about the energy transition, because that's the theme, I think if we, put, if we could put more rationality in the debate and have debates around that that are science-based, fact-based, and in the way opinions are formed about that, I think that would help tremendously the world to go faster and more clever, cleverly to the, to the, to the goal. So, there's a lack of rationality mm. in most of the debate, so Agreed. that's a wish. Agreed. Before we close uh, I, and turn it over to uh, Kristen Panarelli, the head of uh, the Electricity Industry for the entire World Economic Forum, who will officially close mm. the session, before, just before that, I would like you all to join me in uh, one single efficient clap. This was all about systemic efficiency. <laughs> so one, one single clap. efficient clap for our excellent panelists on the count of three, all together. One, two, three. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Beautiful. That's a good saving. Thank System. you, Emily, for you making this, this, this did, panel did you, did you fun. No, no, they're Did just Did you train for that? Just <laughs> <laughs> like that? Wow. Emily just made energy efficiency fun. <laughs> thank you, Emily, for moderating this panel, and thank you to our panel members for their leadership on the energy transition. In 2020, uh, the, the World Economic Forum is going to step up efforts on efficiency and on systemic efficiency and trying to take a more holistic approach. Our platform will be hosting uh, different initiatives and coalitions in order to create more momentum on this topic and to also create better alignment across the different sectors that are, that are in a city ecosystem and that need to be working together in order to create more impact. Uh, to our audience here, um, we invite you to, to share your ideas, um, share your initiatives with us and, and join in on, on this effort. Thanks to everybody for, for being here today.